God bless you. Thank you, young ladies. And I certainly appreciate all that's been done in this meeting. I'm excited and thrilled what the Lord is doing. I'm so glad to have a part in this meeting. I tell you, every single thing, everything has just stirred my heart. And thank God for it. I'm glad to be in the Lord's work, aren't you? Glad I'm on my way to heaven. I love my brother and thank God for him. I would not be going to heaven if he did not tell me how to know Jesus. Stayed with me too. Didn't give up on me. Thank God for that. I want you to take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter number 8. The Gospel of Luke chapter number 8. We're going to read a few verses tonight and I want to share with you something that God's really helped me to try to get a hold of. You know, we need the Lord to open our minds and our hearts of understanding. If God doesn't do that, we just don't get it. Long after people have forgotten the title of our message, our name, and our little outlines, the only thing that's going to change a person's life is what God does and how God helps them to see and understand. And I always ask God to help me, to help me not just to preach a message, but to say what God once said and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts as only he can. And I want you to look with me as we read Luke chapter number eight, and we're going to turn some other verses a little later on, but. In Luke chapter number eight, the Bible says in verse number one, and it came to pass afterwards that he went throughout every city and village. You ought to make note of that. He went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Charles's Herod Stuart, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Father, dear Lord, I thank you again for your goodness, and I ask you, Lord, to help me tonight. Dear Lord, that you might anoint me fresh and new with your spirit. And dear Lord, you would do tonight what I cannot do, and that is speak to our hearts, open our minds and our hearts of understanding. Help us to see and to understand what you want us to do with our lives. And Lord Jesus, I know tonight there is a world that's waiting waiting to hear the glorious gospel. And so dear God, I pray tonight that you would connect the need with these laborers. Help me. When the last amen is said, not only in this service, but in this meeting, may we leave here and truly make a difference in this world. And we'll thank you, for we ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. I will speak tonight on this subject, the Lord Jesus and his gospel crusaders. The Lord Jesus and his gospel crusaders. I certainly appreciate my brother's emphasis on this meeting to confront unbelief talking about gospel crusaders. I like it, don't you? Yes, sir. I think God wants everybody to be one. You know, the Lord Jesus came into this world, according to the Bible. He came to die for our sins. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them. Amen. Aren't you glad Jesus came, and aren't you glad he died for our sins? 
He paid our sin debt in full. The greatest day in anyone's life is the day that they hear and believe the gospel. Thank God for that. Now the Lord Jesus, during his earthly ministry, trained and equipped his followers. And we have in the text we read tonight, one of the times when the Lord Jesus took this group, these people, and took them down to Galilee. And the Bible says that he was preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus preaching? Can you imagine? And the Lord Jesus going down to Galilee, he's preaching the glorious gospel. And then he's showing what God can do in a person's life. He's got with him all these people. He's got the 12 disciples. He's got certain women, the Bible says, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And then the word of God says, he's got many others also. I don't know who all was with him, but I imagine that this crowd was quite a crowd to go. I mean, you are talking about exciting. Can't you just picture in your mind's eye the Lord Jesus coming down the Galilee with this group of people, the disciples, these women, and many others which have been saved and transformed by the power of God, and he's preaching. And then he's showing what God can do. I, I can just picture in my mind's eye uh, him asking some to give a testimony and share what, what has happened in their life. And then he's not only letting people see what God is doing, but he's showing his followers how to do the work of God. He's teaching and he's training and he's helping them. And I want you to think about that tonight. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus came and he began the Word of God says, both to do and to teach. He began both to do and to teach in Acts chapter number one. So what he started, he wants us to continue. The Lord Jesus was on a mission from God and now we have a mission from God. His mission is our mission. And God wants us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and not leave one village, not leave one city, not leave one person out. And so the Lord Jesus is taking with him these people that I like to call the first gospel crusaders, the disciples, these certain women, and many others. And here they go. They're going down to Galilee. Now, these are folk who have trusted Christ as their Savior. They know the Lord. They have received Christ and now they're following God. And look, God's put this team together. What an amazing group. You've got bankers and beggars and fishermen and fighters and the whole crowd, but they're following the Lord Jesus going down to Galilee. And he's going to do a great, great work in their life. Now they're going to heaven, but on their way to heaven, they're going to take as many people as they can. And by the way, aren't you glad Aren't you glad for the day that a gospel crusader came to your life? Aren't you glad that there was a day that somebody that was on a mission from God told you how to know the Lord as your personal Savior? And so I started thinking about how the Lord trained people and equipped people. My brother and I both had the privilege of working uh, with and for Dr. Lee Robertson. And Dr. Lee Robertson, to me, is the greatest Christian I have ever known. And I thank God for him. And uh, Dr. Robertson was an amazing man. There's so many things about him that just, just stirs my heart. My wife and I now are thinking about the time we spent with him and the little things we learned. And my goodness, I'd like to have some of those days again. But one thing that he was just amazing at was he knew how to help people get a hold of what God wanted them to do with, his, with their life. And that's, that's something. 
He asked me the day that I joined the staff, he was walking down the street with me, and he said, Tom, I want to ask you a question. He said, if people aren't being saved, then there's one of two reasons. He said, number one, the gospel has lost its power, or number two, the gospel is not being given. And so then he asked me, which one do you think it is? Well, I said, the gospel will never lose its power. And you had to know him the way he would answer. That's right, that's right. And then he said this, make sure everyone can give the gospel. Well, wow, that's something, isn't it? Make sure that everyone can give the gospel. You know what the Lord Jesus was doing? He was teaching all of his followers how to give the gospel, how to share the gospel, how to preach the gospel, how to make sure that every single person has a chance to hear. I learned from Dr. Robertson, the first thing that you do when someone trusts the Lord as Savior is encourage them to tell a family member what God has done for them. Now that's important. Children get saved. We ought to encourage them. Go home and tell a family member. Take a gospel track and tell a family member what the Lord has done for you. Do you know what happens? When they start, when they do that, God starts a work in their family. God begins that process in that home. I tell you, it's an amazing thing. I remember when my brother came home and uh, told my mother, he's told me and said here many times how he came home from a meeting and he'd trust the Lord as his savior and he told our mother that he got saved. Now the response wasn't what it should have been, but I can tell you one thing, it put him on the spot. This means amen. amen. <laughs> when he announced that he had trusted the Lord as savior, we wanted to know if it was real. <laughs> And look, when we encourage someone to go home and to share with the family what God has done in their life, not only does it begin a work in the family's life, but it helps that Christian live right in the home. Not only that, Dr. Robertson said, make sure that when people get saved, they not only tell a family member, but make sure they tell somebody they work with or someone they go to school with. I learned over the years that if you'll do that, God will begin a work in the school and in the place of business. You know, the Bible says the adulterer hunts for precious life. And one thing that we can do to help people not get captured by the devil when God saves them is to help them share their faith. Because when they share their faith, that is the last person that... The, the adulterer wants to find. He doesn't want to get the woman who's got gospel tracts and inviting everybody to church, uh, everybody to a meeting at, in the business place. He doesn't want to get that woman involved. They don't take that person to their nightclubs. They don't take that person to their lunch tables when they tell dirty things. They leave that person alone. And we help that person by sharing and encouraging them to share their faith at work. Amen. Are you still with me? Now, the Lord Jesus was teaching his followers how to do what God sent him into this world to do. There are three groups of people that we read about in this passage of Scripture. I want you to look at them if you would. The Bible says, and, the, and it came to pass that afterwards that, the, that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. Now, just for this message, you let me do this if you would. I want you to think about these 12, the disciples, as leaders. These are the ones that God has chosen. They're going to be strong men, all except for one. Now, they're not there yet. They're still learning some things. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter number 9, they reason among themselves which one's going to be the greatest. Then they can't figure out who the enemy is. They rebuke someone that's getting people saved. And then 
they, they have a bad spirit and want to call fire down from heaven and burn people up. They've got a ways to go, but nevertheless, these are the men that's going to determine where the gospel goes. One of the great responsibility of a leader is to decide where the gospel goes. Now, I pastor Gulf Coast Baptist Church. And it's my responsibility to make sure that our Jerusalem hears the gospel. Do you believe that tonight? But look, I have to be led of God. I have to make some decisions where our church invests, where our church takes the gospel. And one day I'm going to give an account to God, not just for my responsibility as pastor and the people, but where I've taken the gospel. And so the Lord Jesus is helping these men get a hold of this great truth that they're going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then we have another group here, and that is these women, certain women. I like that word certain. You know, there are certain people that are in our churches, you know, special people, certain people. They're not called, they're not preachers, they're not the ones that we would say are the leaders, but they're certain people. And I like to call this group workers. They're workers. These are the folk that help us reach people. These are the folk that help us do what we do. Thank God for workers. Amen. I'm going to say a little more about it in a moment. And so you have on this gospel team, you have leaders and then you have workers. In a moment, we'll say a little more about workers. And then there's another group, and that are, the, the Bible says, and many others. And just for the sake of this message, would you let me call them followers? So we have leaders, workers, and followers. Leaders, workers, and followers. If leaders don't have workers and workers don't have followers, we're not going to reach the world. If we do not have a plan to help followers become workers and workers to become leaders, we're not going to reach the world. The only way that this works is we've got to develop leadership and, and enlist workers and encourage followers and keep moving and training and equipping people to reach the world. And the Lord Jesus had, on his gospel team, he had leaders, he had workers, he had followers, and then he had all these cities and villages to reach. And that's what God's given us to do. He's given us this great opportunity to reach people with the gospel. Now, I want to very quickly cover a couple of things about these because I want us to get a hold of this one great truth in a moment. But first, you have followers. These are people that have made a decision to follow the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 12, verse number one and two, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We want people who know the Lord to join this great movement and to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And these folk, these many others in the word of God had answered the call when the Lord Jesus said, follow me. They said, here we go. Where are you going? Don't know. How are you going? Don't know. But we do know who we're going with. We're going with Jesus. And the most important thing in the world is to make sure you're going with Jesus. Because if you go with Jesus, everything's going to be okay. He's going to put it all together for you. And so here they are. They had given their life to follow. 
If we fail to give our life to God, we limit what God can do with us. If we fail to give our life to God, we limit what God can do with us. Can you imagine limiting God? Can you imagine holding back what God can do? The Bible says in the Gospel of Mark, the Lord Jesus said, you've made the word of God of none effect. Now there are people who have made the word of God of none effect, but can you imagine limiting God? What can God do with us? What can God do with you? What can God do with me? We'll never know that until we surrender our life and put our life on the altar and follow the Lord. Then God will take us on the most amazing journey. Thank God for that. And so thank God for the followers. Thank God for those people who get saved and they follow the Lord and believe his baptism and they say, you know what? I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to try to share the, the gospel with my family. I'm going to try to reach my friends. Now they got a long way to go, but thank God they're following the Lord. And as they follow the Lord, God will reveal some things to them. See, we will never know God's will for our life until we start doing God's will with our life. Let me say that again. We will never know God's will for our life until we start doing God's will with our life. We've got to do it. When we follow the Lord, God will reveal his plan and his purpose for our life. There are so many people tonight, so many Christians tonight that are praying, Lord, what is your will for my life? And I think sometimes we get it so backwards, we get it turned around because it's not God's will for my life. It must first be my life for God's will. And once we give God our life, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, he will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will. If we will give our life to do God's will, God will show us his will for our life. That's followers. And then you have the second group, and these are folk that are workers. Now the Bible says in Luke chapter number eight, the word of God says that they had been healed. I like that word, don't you? You know, when you say they've been healed, People say, now hold on a second. I want you to know this. God still is in the healing business. Now God does heal people physically. I'm glad he does. He doesn't always because the Bible says, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But I want you to know that God will heal. He will heal. He always saves whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And you don't get any better healing than being brought to life, ye have he quickened in Ephesians chapter two, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now that's pretty good healing to be brought to life. And then if you'll give your life to God, he will heal your mind. You know, we live in a day where people need their mind renewed. The mind. It's shocking what people have heard, what they've seen what they believe. And if someone is gonna be a worker for God, if they're gonna serve God and do something for God, they're gonna to have to have God touch them and help them. They're gonna to have to have the mind of Christ. And then the Bible says that God will purge our conscience. Aren't you glad that God can do that? Look, you know, if you're involved in the Lord's work, you know that there are people who get saved, that have lived a while, and they've done some things. They would to God they never did. All oh, they're saved. They're on the way to heaven. And they get their mind renewed. But their conscience need purged. They need God to help them. Add to your faith virtue. Purity. A 
conscience undefiled. It is possible for God to purge our conscience and to help us because you have the woman at the well going back and saying to everybody, come see a man that knows everything that we've ever done. <laughs> oh, thank God he can heal your conscience. Amen. He can heal your broken heart. Amen. A lot of people with a broken heart. He can heal your wounded spirit. He can heal your family. But what God wants to do is help us win personal victory. And the Bible says that these women had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, on whom went seven devils. And then he goes on to name the others. You see, God wants to deliver us. God wants to help us not only to be healed, but God wants us to lay aside some things and go forward for him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two, wherefore seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. See, God wants us to get involved in his work. And the only way we can is we've got to lay aside some things. And these workers had won some personal victory. And I thank God for that because if we fail to win personal victory, we will never have a place of service in a local church. You've got to win personal victory. When I got saved, I had a lot of things that needed attention right away. And um, some did. And then I'm so glad that nobody took a pad and a pencil and wrote down all the things I had to quit doing. I probably would have had a heart attack. And one of the things that I did, and I, I say this, and, and I, I hope you understand, but one of the things that I did when I got saved, I smoked. Well, I didn't smoke, that's not true. The cigarette smoked, I sucked it. I was a sucker. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, no one talked to me about it because they just thought I had these other things they needed to help me with that was so bigger than that. And so I never thought about it. And I did not know you, you had to quit smoking when you got saved, you know. Mind you, you don't have to quit. You can smell like the devil if you want to, but. But, but Pastor Riley made a plea. We need choir members. I said, hey, I, I, I like that. I can sing a little bit like, like Hank Williams and Elvis Presley. I'll just get up in the choir. And so I got up in the choir, and I never will forget, I was sitting in the choir, and I had my cigarettes in my shirt pocket. And Brother Riley looked at me, and he said, Tom, I don't, I don't think, listen, there's some very important things I need help with. Maybe those would be better for you right now than this. He was trying to be diplomatic about telling me, you can't sing in a choir with cigarettes in your shirt pocket. <laughs> Thank God for that, amen. By the way, I found out that you cannot put gospel tracks and cigarettes in the same shirt pocket. <laughs> I found that out. But I listened. I never will forget winning that victory. I went forward, my wife and I went forward. Now look, I, was, I became a closet smoker. I was a new Christian, but I mean, I didn't want anybody to know it, you know. I was being convicted about it. One day I went forward at church and <clears throat> my wife and I gave our home to God. And I went home after we got home, I, I, I pulled out a cigarette. My wife said, honey, we, we gave our home to the Lord. I don't think you can do that in our house anymore. I said, really? <laughs> Should have known that before I went forward and did that. Wow. So I said, oh, said, she said, well, you know, our property line belongs to God. We gave it all to God. I said, all right, I'll get out on the street. My neighbors must have looked at me and thought, what kind of idiot? And then I was trying to witness the people on the job. I was working with people and I never will forget a man putting his finger on my shirt pocket and saying, don't talk to me anymore with those in your pocket. Then I remember one day, Brother Riley got me memorizing the scripture. He said, you need to, need to memorize scripture. 
And I was working on the Romans road and, and things. And, and I was memorizing the great commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach and observe all things whatsoever I'm, I command you. And lo, I am with you. Amen. You know, have you ever tried, think about this, tried to smoke a cigarette and go, Lord, I'm with you. You can't put Jesus out of your car to finish anything. I said, Lord, this is something. In his presence is where you win personal victory. Now look, the Lord Jesus took this crowd down to Galilee, preaching the gospel in his presence. That's where people win victory. When you get people involved in the Lord's work, when they start talking to people about the Lord, they win personal victory. And as they win personal victory, they can start doing some things. They become workers. And the level of their place of service is going to depend on how many victories they win. But thank God for that. And so we have to help people get the victory in their life. Now, there's a golden rule here, and that is this. You must accept people where they are. You've got to love them and see their worth. Got to help them. Got to help them. Amen. Just get them started. Let them do something for God. Let them tell their family. Let them tell their friends. Let them join you and tell others. Let them be a part of something where they can share the, the word, of, word of God and God will start delivering them from their infirmities. And there'll be such victory and such joy because we have to have workers and we have to have workers who understand what it means to win personal victory. We have to have workers that have influence. They can help others. We have to have workers that understand what it's like to be a follower so they can encourage a follower to reach their friends and their family. And then you have the disciples who represent leaders. Leaders. Now this is the crowd that's going to determine what's done for God. And by the way, God wants all of us to become leaders. I want you to look with me, if you would, please, in the gospel according to Matthew chapter number nine. In Matthew chapter number nine, the Bible says that um, verse number 32, and that he went out, behold, oh, excuse me, let's look down at verse number 35, because of time. And Jesus went about all the city and villages, teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He's got them. He's out crusading. The Bible says, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now watch. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Bible says, as the Lord Jesus went about, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Compassion is more than just having hurt for people and having love for people. Compassion is having people in your heart. And it's an amazing thing that God takes people and puts them in our hearts. You heard Dr. Kennedy stand here and talk about China and uh, God has put China in his heart. As he thinks about those people, there's, I'm sure there's faces that cross his mind and people and he thinks about them and while he's talking about them, God speaks to us about it. See, here's the thing that every leader needs to understand. God will only give us laborers to accomplish what we have in our heart to do. And when we pray, Lord, send forth laborers, the Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And God knows what we have in our heart to do. And when God sees that we have a heart full of people, God will send forth laborers 
into the harvest. And so a leader's responsibility is to make sure that they get their heart filled with what God wants done in this world. By the way, do you believe the Lord still has more in his heart to be accomplished in this world? If that were not true, the rapture would have taken place. Listen, God wants more churches. God wants more schools. God wants the work of the Lord to go around the world. God wants the gospel to go to every single person. And before we'll reach those people, somebody has to have them in their heart. What makes great churches and great pastors is not their their ability to preach or put together a sermon or all of that. What makes great churches is how many people do they have in their heart? Because that's what God gives us laborers to accomplish. Now watch. Turn, if you would, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 14. In John, chapter number 14, the Lord Jesus said, He's going to prepare a place for us. But look at verse number 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Now watch. And greater works than these shall he do. He says, greater works than these shall he do. See, God will let us do greater things according to what we have in our heart to do. Somebody says, I want to do something great for God. Then go get people in your heart. Fill your heart with people. What makes a bus captain successful is not how many hours he visits or all the programs he does, but what makes a bus captain successful is how many children does he have in his heart. That's the way the work of the Lord is done. And the Lord Jesus is trying to get the disciples to look unto the field while in the harvest, to see people like God sees them. Somebody's got to get this world in their heart if we're ever going to make a difference in it. And so the word of God says, when you pray the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The truth of the matter is we've got so many things in our hearts today that we don't have a place for God's work and the people who need God. If we're going to do anything for God, if this is going to become a movement, if we're going to reach the world, if something is going to happen here, we've got to do one thing, determine. We're going to get the need in our hearts. We have to see it. We have to see it. I just finished reading a biography about John Mason Peck, great Baptist preacher, powerful preacher. (laughs) And the man who wrote the biography said, I went to a preacher's meeting. It was in 1845. John Peck was born the day President Washington became president of the United States, missionary to the West. But this man was writing a biography. He said, I went to a preacher's meeting. And at that time, there was a lot of division among preachers, Baptists, and they were fighting and trying to decide whether we're going to reach the world. And there was an anti-mission movement, and they were trying to stop missionaries from going around the world. And he said, I went to a meeting, and there were two men preaching in that meeting. One of them was Ananias Judson, and the other one was John Peck. He said, after that meeting, nothing was ever the same. Those men stirred people to reach the world for God. Get out and get this world for God. Put to silence the critics. Mighty men of God Use their influence to launch a movement that continued to shake the world. Dear friends, we have to get people in our heart if we're going to have influence. 
to stir people to do something for God. We're not going to get labors in our cities, in our churches. And it's all about what you have in your heart. I've been asked quite often, what happened to great churches that I knew that no longer exist? And I, you know, there's a lot of reasons. But the one reason, the one reason is when the pastor who had in his heart to reach the world, when he left, the next pastor didn't have it. So God didn't give him the laborers. God will only give us the laborers to reach what we have in our heart to do. That's it. You don't get a bunch of laborers then try to organize to reach the world. You see what God wants done. You get it in your heart and you say, oh God, give us laborers. And God will give leaders workers. And workers give followers. And followers can be encouraged to reach others. And the Lord Jesus took with him the disciples. They're going to be great leaders. Now there's a ways to go. He took with him these workers. They had one personal victory. They could give a testimony how God delivered them. And then he took with them certain people. And then the Bible says they ministered unto him of their substance. He didn't have any money. Everything was taken care of by the people that God gave him. We think our greatest need is money. No, the greatest need is laborers. When God gives us people, people bring with them all that we need to reach the world. Amen. So let me ask you this. What's in our heart tonight to do? What's in our heart? The most important thing in the world is having people in our hearts because that's what makes the difference in everything. Let's bow our heads in just a moment. We're going to pray. With our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, if you're here tonight and you do not know for sure you're going to heaven, Dear friend, tonight, tonight, trust the Lord as Savior. Trust Him. There are people here with Bible in hand who love you, who care about you. They'll show you from God's Word how you can know for sure that heaven's going to be your home. Tonight, if you're here and you say, Brother Tom, I want to be a follower. I want to be a gospel crusader. Then answer the call. Follow me. Get started. You got to begin somewhere. Why not begin tonight? If you're here tonight and you say, I want to be a worker. I want to, I want to help the pastor. I want to do something for God. I want to be one of those mighty men, one of those certain people that God talks about. Then win some personal victories. Maybe there's something you're battling tonight. Put it on the altar. Every time you win a personal victory, God will help you do more for him. But if you're here tonight and you say, you know, I'm a leader. Maybe you're a leader in your church. Maybe you're a pastor. Maybe you're a missionary. Maybe you're, 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 you're one that leads others. What we need tonight, more than anything in this world, we need to see people like God sees them. Say, Lord, fill me with what you want done. Let God transform you. What made these disciples Christ-like was they saw the world like God saw it. Tonight, you say, God has spoken to me. You come and let some.